This is Rogers TV. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming today and welcome. My name is Anne-Marie Sanchez and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Our timekeeper is Diana. Diana, if you can just raise your hand. She will be keeping us on time in the for the next 90 minutes. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank our volunteers who have been assisting with the evening. And if you can all raise your hand, just in case if anyone has questions, they can come seek you for help. And that is Darshi, Zenaida, Mary, Susan, Marina, and Patricia. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, just to give everyone a little bit of a heads up, we have about two or three minutes of housekeeping items, and then we'll get to uh, we'll get the show on the road. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and the many Indigenous people of this region. The three long-standing Indigenous groups of this region are Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenalamakuk, and I'd like to also recognize the uh, First Nation communities neighboring the City of London, Chippewas of the First Nations, Oneida Nations of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. We recognize that we, as the Urban League members of the community, have a role to play in relationship building and reconciliation, and that reconciliation has more to do about uh, more than just talk, and it's based on action. Megwij Yako Anishik. The Urban League of London is hosting all candidate meetings with partner organizations from across London. This includes ANOVA, Climate Action London, Inclusive Economy London and Region, London Cycle Link, London Environmental Network, London Intercommunity Health Centre, London School of Racialized Leaders, London Middlesex Lon uh, Local Immigration Partnership, Pillar Nonprofit, and Young London. We are hosting 14 meetings throughout London before the municipal election, which is scheduled for October 24th, 2022. A volunteer-run committee was struck by the Urban League and has been meeting since January to organize these meetings. The committee is composed of individuals from various organizations across the city and set the goal of encouraging participation in local government and the political process. The committee has invited all candidates to participate. Along with partner organizations, the committee also created a list of important questions to ask candidates. We request that everyone here today be respectful to the candidates and your fellow audience members. We would also like to encourage that those of you who are in the audience who use social media to tag us in their Facebook post, Twitter, and Instagram. The details are provided on the poster at the back of the room. We would also like to especially thank Beacock Library for their support in providing this meeting space. We'd also like to thank the London Community Foundation for sponsoring the uh, All Candidates meetings and remind everyone of the release of the Vital Signs Report, Be the Change. This is a biannual check-in on how we are faring on issues that are significant to well-being and quality of life. The latest report focuses on making systemic change by coming together to participate in collective action. The report is available at bethechangelondon.ca. A big thank you as well to Rogers TV for filming the event and broadcast. Now let me explain the ground rules that we're going to follow. I will draw candidates' names from a hat to determine speaker order. Each candidate has two minutes for an opening introduction. And our first candidate will draw from a hat each question and they will be given two minutes to provide an answer. Because there are five candidates, um, we will only be giving two to three candidates an opportunity for rebuttal, but I will be making notes to ensure that there is fair uh, opportunity for everyone to, uh, to, to post a rebuttal. This continues until each candidate has drawn at least one question. Candidates, please be sure to speak clearly into the microphones. You are able to remove them from the stands if you choose to do so. Once every candidate has completed a question from the hat bowl, we will then select the questions provided by the audience. If you registered in advance, you had the opportunity to pre-submit questions. We'll be going through those questions first. And if we do still have time, then we can take questions from the audience at large. Now, how timekeeping works. This is an important one. The, key, the timekeeper has three cards, a green card, a yellow card, and a red card. 
When your allotted time begins, the green card will be held up at the 30 second point from the end of time. So when you have 30 seconds left, she will raise the yellow card. The red card is held up when you must immediately end your answer. As the moderator, my job is to move through these questions and the night along, and I will make sure that everyone is treated fairly time-wise and has the same amount of time as the other. All candidates were provided with the questions in advance to afford them the opportunity to prepare their responses. I will read the questions as they are drawn. Before we begin, I would also like to point out that the candidates in the room who are also running as school board trustees. So far, I am aware of Leroy uh, Osborne and Marianne Larson. If you can just wave your hands at the back. Thank you. And if you have any questions between 8.30 and 9, there's a time, there's an informal part of this meeting where you can ask them questions and I believe they have literature in the back as well. I would also like to mention that for the first time, the Huron Heights Community Association is holding um, Thames Valley District School Board Trustee Candidates Meeting for Wards 2 and 6, and that will be held October 3rd at the Salvation Army at 310 Vesta Road between 6.30 and 9 p.m. Okay, so now I will draw the names so that we determine the order. And it's from this hat, all five names are in this hat. And then after this, we will start with introductions. So we will be, the first speaker will be Bob Wright. The second will be Saifula. The third speaker will be Prob. The fourth speaker will be Peter Cuddy. And the last speaker will be Ainsley. So I repeat, Bob Wright, Saifula Kasimi, Prob Gill, Peter Cuddy, and Ainsley Graham. Bob, if you'd like to begin. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Bob. Uh, a lot of you I've met uh, out walking the roads, dropping off literature. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. Spent the last 22 years before my retirement in 2020 as a mediator for the Ontario Labor Relations Board, specializing in uh, construction trades, mediating between labors, labor unions and employers. Uh, I have three degrees from Western. Grew up in what is now Ward 2, just across the tracks from Ward 3. Have lived in what I have always described as Huron Heights, but my longtime neighbors remind me is actually Ridgeview Heights. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting to know you, listening to you, and hopefully helping you deal with your issues with the city. I think my background makes me uniquely qualified to serve as your representative at City Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And now, Saifullah. Hello, everyone. My name is Saifullah Kasmi. I am participating in the City Council election from Ward Number 3, London, Ontario. I have eight year experience of business having a Petro-Canada gas station. At the moment, I am in a real estate profession serving the people to selling and buying their homes from the last 10 years. I am taking my services to the next level to work for the whole Londoner or especially for my ward people to help them to solve their issues, to answer all their questions, whatever they have. So this is my goal, to make the London best for living. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Prab Gill. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, Urban League uh, for putting together such a wonderful event. I'd like to thank the audience for being present and giving us the opportunity to connect with you. I'd like to uh, thank my uh, candidate uh, colleagues uh, taking initiative and uh, represent to run for Ward 3. I congratulate you all. My name is Prop Gill, and I am running to represent Ward 3. Ward 3 is home. That's where my wife and I raised a beautiful child named Noor. 
my daughter. That's where she first started to walk. That's where she went to school. And that's where she made her first friend. Ward 3 has deep connections with our family and we have deep love for Ward 3. Professionally, I'm a human rights advocate working in affiliation uh, with the United Nations. Uh, my job is to actually provide access to justice. I'm also a humanitarian aid coordinator. My job is to empower marginalized communities in which I'm working very closely with missions in downtown, whether Arcade, Salvation Army, and Men's Mission, to empower our homeless uh, community. I'm also serving three community boards with City of London, as well as I'm a proud ally and a proud partner with Diabetes Canada. And my job is to see Canada diabetic-free country, and that's our vision. We raised over $50,000 alone this year, and last year's $177,000 to support insulin and support diabetes. My main goal is to run for this position, actually, to fulfill the very core duty of a city councilor, which is to be present always and willing to listen. I believe empowering community strengthen the weak, and building positive connection with the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Peter Cuddy. Hi, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, my name's Peter Cuddy. I'm currently um, a trustee for the Thames Valley District School Board. I was elected in 2018. I am serving as vice chair this year. I also own my own businesses in London, and I own properties in Ward 3. I grew up in Strathroy on a turkey farm. I learned to pick eggs at a very young age. Uh, went to Western, um, did three degrees there, including my MBA in uh, 1995 through 97. Um, married. Uh, during that period, I worked for Cuddy Foods, and we built a plant out in Ward 3, uh, out on Cuddy Boulevard. And uh, I spent much of my time uh, building a new comp uh, my own company after I left Cuddy's in 1999. Um, 1950, in 2015, I, I lost, lost my wife to cancer, which was a turning point in my life. Now, I have since remarried this year, but at that time in 2015, I turned my focus away from building my own career to giving back to the communities, giving back to my community, and becoming a better person. I became a member of the, uh, as I mentioned, I, I ran and, uh, and uh, became an elected uh, Thames Valley District School Board uh, trustee, but also I, uh, I became a member of the um, uh, Fanshawe Optimist Club. My objective is to serve this community and serve it to the best of my ability, much like I've done as a trustee. I look forward to working with you and speaking with all of you, if not tonight, then when I meet you at your doors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, Ainsley Graham. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Ainsley Graham, and I'm running for Ward 3 City Council. Any East Ender that I've ever met, when I've asked them what part of London are you from, they've always proudly proclaimed, I'm an East Ender. We always have a sense of belonging and pride in our words, and I will always think of myself as an EOAer. I've gone to school here, attending St. Anne's, JP2, and Fanshawe. I've ridden my bike through every neighborhood as a child. But as an adult, I have noticed that this part of London is getting left behind. I am choosing to run because I see opportunities to create better neighborhoods in a more accessible city. No one should have to choose between having a roof over their head or buying groceries. We need better mental health services and families need to feel safe as they use our roads and sidewalks to take their kids to school. These are just some of the reasons as to why I'm running. You deserve a counselor who is compassionate, advocates for you, is present, and who actually hears your concerns. If elected, I do choose to make this my full-time job. I intend on taking the issues through actions and not words. On October 24th, I hope that I can count on your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will start the question period, first with Bob Wright. 
Okay, first question of the night is on housing. The federal government's new national housing plan aims to cut chronic homelessness by 50% in the next 10 years. Currently, London faces critical challenges in providing safe, adequate, affordable housing. What role do you see the municipal government taking to help achieve the 50% reduction? Just want to stay off the bat. I do support the goal of increasing the supply of affordable housing. Sorry, I'm going to refer to some of my notes. Um, the current council has made it a priority through the 2023 budget. Don't know if all of you are aware, but the city has adopted a four-year budget model. It's a very business-like approach, and it provides for better long-term planning. As part of that budget, 40% of the new spending is earmarked for housing. That's $51 million out of $134 million in projected new spending. I don't know if you have had a chance to take a look at Josh Morgan's platform. If you do, uh, it looks like he's going to be our likely mayor. Um, he's proposing that there be 50,000 new housing units in 10 years, and I certainly support that goal. Housing currently represents about 5% of the city budget. It's important to realize that if we're going to make a significant commitment to increasing the supply of housing, that is going to have monetary and budgetary implications and probably result in some increases in taxation. Thank you. Thank you. And now there's an opportunity for rebuttal. Who would like to respond? At this time, we can only take two to three. Ainsley, Prob, anyone else? Nope. Okay. Um, Ainsley, sorry. One minute per rebuttal. Thank you. And so, Ainsley, if you'd like to go first. Okay, perfect. So volunteering and outreach has made me see firsthand what an entire population is experiencing at street level. They have nowhere to go, and most of the shelter beds are full. There needs to be more services put in place by the municipality and the province that offer wraparound services for unhoused and sleeping rough population of London. Some of this can be done by taking over vacant or derelict buildings in both the core and other parts of the city. We need to give housing to our most vulnerable populations. Thank you, Prop. Well, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, we have to understand that what's the cause of homelessness? And as being a humanitarian aid coordinator, I've been I'm talking to the, uh, the homeless community, folks that comes from poverty, mental health issues, and drug abuse. And why are we just talking about affordability here? We need to talk about sustainability as well. We need to fix, first fix these three issues, and how do we do that? We need to get the community involved. We need to show passion from the neighborhoods, and we need to bring human values to the, to the issue here. And why is it just increasing in London? Last year only, we've seen 400 plus uh, homeless folks landing in, 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 in London. It seems like you are, London is being downloaded, uh, the problem here. As when I, when I am elected, I will work with the private organizations such as ARC Aid and join hands to provide resources. I will also assist CHMC and Endwell and work together to bring better results. Thank you. Thank you. Now for our next question, and it goes to Saifullah. The topic is governance. The pandemic presented new and unprecedented challenges to our city. In looking ahead to a pandemic recovery strategy, what are your top three priorities and why? Thank you very much. Our top three priorities are, first of all, we have to work for the recovery of the economy of the city because the city needs the money to continue his projects smoothly. I think in that particular part, we have to focus on the new housing. 
if we make new housing, so definitely we can develop more revenues. And in the same time, we can uh, fulfill our uh, requirements for the homeless people. And second priority is because during the pan pandemic, so our especially the care home people, they were totally uh, isolated and they, nobody was allowed to go in their homes. So we have to make we have to make the things easy for them to make the more socialized so they can come back in the life back. And the third priority, I think so we have to make ourselves be ready for the future. Anything happen or anything uh, we can face in the future like the pandemic. So we should have to be mentally prepared. So we should have some sufficient revenues so we can meet that challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And who would like to provide a rebuttal? Bob and Prab, is there anyone else? Okay, and Peter. So let's start with Peter, then Prab, and then Bob. For the three priorities, uh, I have four pillars uh, in my platform. Uh, the first is we have to foster better development in Ward 3. We've had a lot of development going on in this area because we have new residential growth. But a lot of it has gone out without any advocacy, no one championing what, what citizens want in this area. And I'll give you an example. We have development going on on, um, on Highbury, uh, where it backs onto Webster Road, and it's really been left without anyone monitoring it. And we can't have development going on without that. We also need better roads and better safety for our citizens in Ward 3. We need lights at Edgewood and Highbury. We need better traffic safety on the roads. And I think those are the priorities that we need to maintain uh, when we're looking at future development. Thank you. Thank you. Prob? Thank you. Pandemic has definitely taught us uh, more than just you know coping up with uh, with the community it taught us you know how to present ourselves as human in society and one of the main priorities i believe that we need to empower our local businesses 90 percent of the employment comes from local i'll give you an example if we buy a cup of coffee from a local coffee shop 40 cents itself goes to the the city instead if you buy coffee from commercial block coffee center, for example, McDonald's or Tim Hortons, only seven cents goes to the city. So you do the math. Second of all, we need to work on mental health campaigns. Folks, as I said again, as a humanitarian, that's what I've been experiencing. Mental health, it, it's up the roof. We, we have broken the community connection. Feels like you know we've been apart from each other. And number third, I will definitely try to bring a, a community prosperity back into our neighborhoods through cultures, festivities, and neighborhood connections. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob? Jumping on something that Prob mentioned, one of my first priorities as a counselor is going to be focusing on things that I can actually do as a counselor. And one of those is attempting to reinvigorate community involvement. COVID has really sort of kicked the legs out of a lot of community organizations and people's participation because they're not meeting person to person. Really want to help strengthen our community associations. We're really lucky in this area. We've got three. Yeah, sorry, I, I better move on. The other is to clean up our parks. I've been really distressed by talking to people who are afraid to use public parks. So we really need to focus on that because those are beautiful spaces that we should be able to enjoy. And lastly, just municipal enforcement of bylaws and property standards. It is the most common complaint I get at the doors and also enforcement of traffic issues. I ran out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob, for adhering to our time constraints. Our uh, next formal question goes to Prob. Hey. Thank you. 
The topic is reconciliation. Indigenous peoples represent 2.6 of London's overall population, but 30% of city's homeless population. What are some of the ways that City Council can address this proportionate representation? Well, thank you for the, for the question. First, we need to understand that we are standing here at the Indigenous uh, land, and we, we need to show respect. Instead of advice, uh, let's listen to the issues. You know, I will work with the community associations to spread awareness. As a prime example, here in Heights, uh, community association just announced uh, awareness uh, uh, workshop. And this is necessary, and that's when, what community needs to do. We need to be there, support them, instead of saying, we understand. No, we don't understand. The best we can do, uh, spread awareness and education. And I will work very hard to get the message across. Thank you. Thank you very much. And who would like to provide a rebuttal? Saifula, Ainsley? OK, we'll go with them. Uh, Saifula, please go ahead. Thank you. Actually, if I could hold the office, so definitely I will prepare, I will organize a committee. And we have to figure out how many homeless people we have in the city, whether they are by in the streets, whether they are by their habit, or they are unfortunate that they, they don't have any family, or they are just uh, passing their life as is. So we have to figure out if they have some family in the reserves or somewhere else, we have to reconcile them and send them back to the, their family. If they are really in need of shelters or homes, so then city has to come forward to understand their issues because they are human beings. So we cannot ignore them. We cannot close our eyes from them. We have to accommodate them. And the best way is, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ainsley. Thank you. So hearing stats like this is actually one of the reasons why I'm running for council. With indigenous peoples representing 30% of the homeless population here in London, the city needs to be working closely with the local indigenous outreach community, like at LOSA, who does amazing work. They need to be able to feel supported and be able to do their work without hitting roadblocks. This will require advocacy and funding and increase ideas like for indigenous, by indigenous housing with wraparound services. We can't have these conversations. We need to have Indigenous peoples leading those conversations for us. Thank you. And now we're on to our fourth formal question, and it goes to Peter. I'll meet you over there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. The topic is moving around the city. What are some of the ways that we can encourage active transportation and public transit in London? And how much of a priority is this issue for you? Well, thanks for the question. You know, we have a very good transit system in the city at the moment um, called bicycles. We have 40 miles of transit system for bikes to get around on. We have, we have one of the best systems, I believe, in the province. But we have a busing system that needs some work. It's broken. I don't think it's working particularly well. I don't think the new systems are working well. And that needs to be looked, looked at. We also need to improve our transportation. And that's one of the platforms in my campaign. And that is improve traffic safety. And we need to do it because, and Ward 3, quite frankly, has been overlooked for traffic safety. We have areas, I mentioned it earlier a minute ago, we have areas like uh, Edge Valley and Highbury that have been waiting for lights for 10 years, 10 years. We had, when I was out canvassing one day, three weeks ago, I called the city and asked how many accidents there had been at the corner of Edge Valley and uh, Highbury uh, in the past year, 64 up to that point, 64 accidents, because we don't have uh, an intersection there. We also need something at, at Killarney where we, we we don't have, it. you can't make a left-hand turn going, going north and you can't make a uh, right-hand turn going, going south. These are simple things that we can fix and improve our transit system. We need better corridors. We need to improve 
uh, the work that we do on our roads. And I think if we can improve our, our, uh, our overall bus system, in which we can, and we improve the intersections at some of our, our major uh, uh, streets, we can make a better transportation area for this, uh, for War 3. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Saifulan, who else would like to provide a re rebuttal? Okay, let's go. Uh, we haven't heard from Prab in a bit. So Prab, Ainsley, and then Saifullah. So I just wanted to, uh, before you actually show me the green card, I just wanted to find, uh, make sure that I encourage active transportation. That was the question? Uh, yeah, no problem. Just one second. I kind of, uh, I'll reread it for yeah, everyone. Please, yeah. uh, what are some of the ways that we can encourage active transportation and public transit in London? And how much of a priority is this issue for you? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, this is very much a priority for me. Uh, transportation is an essential, uh, and my ward is away from uh, major hubs. We do have uh, a major hub, one of the major hubs in Fanshawe, but it is not really accessible. Uh, we need to connect people. We need to have frequency in bus services, and we need to connect employees to the employment sectors and shopping centers and fam with the families uh, in an efficient prime uh, manner. Bus, bus shelters are also lacking services. I was at the, uh, the bus stop, and uh, believe it or not, there were two sitting inside the shelter and the rest of them standing outside. When it's extreme cold or heat, where would you expect uh, the, the people stand or sit? And that has to be a priority when I got elected. Thank you. Thank you, Ainsley, and then Saifullah. Personally, I love this question because the TVP is something that I think is a beautiful um, access way to get around London. It connects so many neighborhoods and communities, um, and it makes it safer for the people who use it. I have a lot of friends who ride their bikes. Uh, not everybody can afford a car. So I do think it's necessary to look at what other cities are doing, taking what they're doing, and making it work for London as well as putting out campaigns for education. Um, that way people are more aware of what the city has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Saifula. Thank you. So by promoting the active transportation in other ways, so we are achieving some other goals also. There are two goals like climate change and plus the global warming. In the sense when we reduce the cars on the road, so definitely there will be less emission of CO2 in the atmosphere. It means so we are achieving that goal of the climate change. And plus, when we are uh, in the city, so we have to uh, organize the safe uh, lanes for the bikes, so we have to promote the bikes also. It will help to make the economical transportation. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're on to our last uh, formal question, and it goes to Ainsley. Thank you. Last for last. Okay, the topic for our last question is belonging, and it's a long one, so I may uh, reread it for the people who want to do a rebuttal. The current city council was the first in the country to add in a pillar to the city strategic plan that specifically focused on making London a safer place for women and girls. How will you, as a city councillor, work to ensure this important pillar is executed? With record numbers of femicides in Canada, what are the opportunities you see available to address gender-based violence in the city of London? Thank you for the question. Um, so as someone who proudly advocates for women's rights and volunteers with women and female identifying folks who are more often than not the target of abuse, we need to always be working with and receiving input on new and current programs from services like ANOVA, London Abused Women's Center, Safe Space, and Western Safe Campus Coalition. We need to attend the protests like the one that was at UWO last year, and we need to also take, or attend protests like Take Back the Night. They need to be the ones leading these conversations, but we also need to make sure that we're having these conversations within our home as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, and who else would like to provide a rebuttal? Okay, so let's go Bob, Peter, 
Prob and Saifullah, did you raise your hand as well? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> First of all, kudos to the current council for making it a pillar for making safety of women a priority. However, in the budget projection, there's no specific monies allocated to monitor that pillar, to effectively uh, educate about what that pillar means to the city, and I think there needs to be some provision made. The assumption was it's part and parcel of all kinds of city programs, and it'll be taken care of that way. If it's an important pillar, there should actually be funds earmarked to monitor whether we're making progress and to uh, educate people about what that pillar means to the community of London. Thank you. Now, Peter? You know, that's, it's, it's such an important part of, of the community that we protect women, that we protect children, but it's education. It's educating those who don't know, the ignorant, and, and that's the problem. And no offense, Ainsley, but protests don't work. We've seen that. It, they just don't work. You need to educate and, and, tra and, and keep educating to tell the individuals what's wrong and how to behave because ignorance just feeds on ignorance and so we need to educate more and again i agree with bob kudos to the city for coming up with that as a pillar thank you thank you prob thank you for the question actually sometimes i think uh, you know we wake up one morning and uh, feel that there's no need for the women's shelters in my uh, culture, there's a phrase, when wise men and kings are born from the womb of women, why well, say bad? To answer this question, uh, my, heart, my heart is full uh, with, with, with sympathy and a passion. When I, when I get elected, I'll make sure that I collaborate with ENOA and Women's Shelter to spread as much education as possible and share this connection with the community so we'll step up and show our family um, human values to the society. Thank you. Thank you. And now Saifullah. Yeah, being a counselor, it would be my duty that I should make the educate the people and give them the awareness about the safety of them. Especially we can uh, provide so many, I think, so police patrolling it will help us to reduce the city crimes and plus we can uh, make the seminars and awareness about the safety of the people so they should know about their safety. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends the formal questions. Um, but as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, um, People who registered for this event tonight had the opportunity to submit questions in advance, and we will be going uh, through these questions. And we will be allotting one question per registrant. Um, and we will start with the same order that we had before. So Bob, you'll start if that's okay. Sure. Um, so what are your goals for our area during office? What are my goals? First and foremost, to be a responsive, available counselor. And yeah, we've kind of lacked that over the last couple of years. We used to have that very much in our ward. It's something, unfortunately, that's been missing in the recent past. Uh, I intend to dedicate my full time. As I had mentioned earlier, I'm retired. Got lots of time on my hands. Spent way too much time sitting on my hands during COVID and I really would like to devote myself to the service of the residents of Ward 3 and to the greater city of London. Uh, I mentioned in the governance section that I have some specific concerns about enforcing municipal bylaws. I share Peter's concerns about traffic issues in the ward. You know, that property maintenance and traffic are probably the most often raised questions when I'm at the door in terms of what's immediately on people's minds. And that's not to take away from the broader issues of housing and poverty and the complete and utter mess that exists downtown that we need to start to address. But first and foremost, I'd like to focus on the concerns of Ward 3 and to listen to you, to help you deal with the city bureaucracy where that's required, uh, and to uh, advocate on your behalf. Thank you. 
Anyone else would like to provide a rebuttal? Peter and Prob. We've been the forgotten ward. We have been neglected for years. And it's about time we take back this ward and we get some investment. And that's one of my pillars, investment in this community. You know, we have parks that don't have any, any water, that aren't provided any water pools. We don't, we don't have any, the, some of our parks don't have adequate playground equipment. And we've seen that at Huron Heights. I've seen that at Ted Early. I've seen it at Cayuga. We need better investment in this community immediately. And secondly, we need better transit systems. We need to put more lights, more stop signs. We need, we need uh, more speed bumps in some of our communities. That's what I've heard from some of you. But more importantly, we need to take back the community because we have not had any investment. The investment has been going west and to the northwest, and it's been going to seven and eight and nine in those words. And we need to get back and take back this community and invest. Thank you. Thank you, Prop. Well, I'm glad uh, this question brought up uh, because uh, as a city councilor, our job is to focus municipally, but we can definitely team up with the provincials and feds. But one of my priorities will be focusing on my ward uh, as well as London as a whole. But my main priority is look, listening to the constituents and make sure I'm present when they need me. Just like, we're, you, just a time to realize that Constituents are the taxpayers and employers, and we are the employees. It's about time to do our job. Number two, let's talk about the, the burnt house on Briar Hill. It's been there for five years. It took two, two years to put, the, to put the fence around. It's a very much safe neighbor, neighborhood safety. We need to literally be there for our neighbors, not with our heart, passion, and there to listen to them, cope up with mental health issues, uh, but last month, when I was talking to uh, you know constituents while I was canvassing, um, I end up uh, coming to uh, notice that there was a high traffic in Westa and made a report to the City of London and got that fixed. Thank and you. I will be doing that continuously. Thank you. Thank you, Prab. Okay, our next question is for Saifula. What are one to three specific opportunities do you see for the city to address environmental concerns and climate change? So for the environmental change, we have to promote the active transportation. In that way, we can help and minimize the CO2 in the atmosphere. And second thing, we have to make the uh, safe bike lines so the people who can travel on the bikes, so they can are more safe, especially in the winter time so in this way we can uh, uh, help to promote the uh, to reduce the co2 in the atmosphere thank you anyone else would like to respond uh, ainsley and then prob oh and bob sure okay <laughs> So a couple of things that I think that London could do that specifically address climate change um, is to be working very closely with the London Environmental Network, so London Environmental Network and Pollinated Pathways. Um, we have already um, addressed, um, uh, pardon me, climate change um, emergency in London. So I think these are all really good steps on our way to get there. Putting more money into uh, bike lanes and getting at least 40 kilometers worth of bike lanes in the city. This will help to cut down on um, car transportation and it should benefit everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Prop? Well, uh, I do agree with my colleague Ainsley, and we need to partner up with the, uh, the Environmental Canada as well. Um, the nature is the reason we, we exist, and I think uh, it'll be really helpful if we get in touch with the Indigenous community. They really know how to, how to live uh, and how to cope up with the environment. Um, when I get elected, I will definitely promote more DEF systems, uh, as we've seen in advanced technology. Uh, that's, that really eliminate uh, you know, CO2 in the, uh, in the environment. We need to promote uh, more bike riders and we need to 
have protected lanes for for, for the for the uh, cyclists. And as a as a leader of my ward, I will definitely have the awareness camps and education provided uh, necessary provide, provide necessary to the, to the neighborhoods, and work together as a community. Thank you. Thank you. And now Bob. One of the biggest things we can do to help reduce greenhouse gases is increase the tree cover in the city. London's known as the forest city. Our percentage of tree coverage has declined significantly, significant, partially due to the emerald ash borer. It's going to take us four to ten years just to recover from the loss from that single insect. But we should be looking to vastly increase the number of trees in the city to reduce the uh, sun bouncing back effect uh, and to uh, absorb carb carbon intake. Uh, that is just a simple goal that the city can do and that individuals can participate in by making sure they plant more trees. Okay. Thank you. Sure. sure, go ahead real thank, quick. Thank you, Emery. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, my colleagues haven't mentioned uh, was is food waste. You know, what a what a huge waste. And, and, and this is something so simple. We have a contracted service now that picks up our recyclables. It is so easy to add on to that. And other cities have done it. Edmonton's a perfect example where they where they pick up their food waste and they dispose of it. So we are eliminating greenhouse gases that way. And if I am elected, if I'm fortunate enough to, if to be elected your councillor, I will push for that with my colleagues. I will ask the other uh, uh, councillors to put together a, a motion that we, uh, we do provide a service to collect food waste. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Prob. Yep. What inspired you to run for City Council and why Ward 3? Well, thank you for the question. What inspired me to run during a pandemic? I made a mission to actually, you know, uh, pack up my bag, gather my team, and go door to door and see how how was everybody doing. As a humanitarian, I made sure that everybody had basic necessities in their house, medication, and cope up with their mental health issues. That's when I really found out that we are missing human values within our society. And that's when I build my campaign on human values and, and connection, strong connection building within our community. I believe my experience working as a humanitarian and human rights advocate, I can be a really strong voice for our community and bringing everyone together. Number two, I feel like there's a gap, a cultural gap. There was a question brought up uh, uh, previously about belonging. And that's one of the another reason that our community is not, uh, you know, uh, feeling the sense that there is actually community, meaning that common unity. We need to bring that, uh, you know, sense back to our neighborhoods. Back in the days when when we were wandering around a neighborhood, you know, we would go to any house on a street and ask for lemonade and cookies. We were offered that. And we don't see this now because we we really feel that it's you and me. Back then it was us. When I, when I get elected, I will bring back the prosperity, bring back the connection we're missing within the community. Along with that, we will grow stronger and we will be ready for, if God forbid, if there's any other pandemic or any other atrocity, because that's what we need to do as a community. Thank you. Thank you. And who would like to provide a response? Safula and then Bob and Peter. Go ahead, Safula. Thank you. So service and commitment is my passion. So this was the main goal to serve the community, especially those people who are living in the care homes. They are my first priority to get them maximum benefits, maximum facilities, because those people are totally isolated from the main society. We have to give them some time. We have to give them some happy life up there because they are just playing their last final inning of their life. So with any ball, they can be out. So we have to give them the maximum comfortable life at, during this time. And my other priorities are to bring the indigenous people close to the city life. And they should also get involved 
in the activities what we have in the city to celebrate their festivals. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bob. What prompted me to run was simple anger. Now, that isn't the word I normally use, but it's not as a polite word. Uh, three candidates had registered, one who clearly didn't live in the ward, and two who didn't provide an address, so there was no way to determine whether they lived in the ward or not. And I went, I believe I'm a uniquely qualified candidate. I've been a two-term trustee. I've been chair of a school board. I served on the Western Board of Governors. I'm a lawyer and a mediator. And I thought, I can serve the people of Ward 3 better. And I, in fact, live there. Is that it? OK. It. <laughs> uh, Peter, go ahead. As a school board trustee since 2018, I, I toured a lot of schools in Ward 3. And uh, while the schools are all, all good schools, they are troubled, especially in Ward 3. This year, I put forward a motion for an extra $100,000 for laptops and iPads and electronic devices for Ward 3 schools. And we got it, 350 laptops and iPads that have been distributed to Chippewa, Hillside, uh, Lord Elgin, F.D. Roosevelt, and a few into Ward 2 schools too, because we didn't have enough. And, and that is what inspired me to run for council because I saw an opportunity to fix things that weren't that weren't fixed and that needed to be done. So I'm here today because I think I can give value through my leadership on the school board as a vice chair. I've learned and I think I've give value as a businessman because I understand how businesses operate and, and this city should operate more like a business. Thank you. Thank you. So now the next question goes to you, Peter. Would you support four-way stops at the two intersections on Vesta Street? Yes, I would. I, I, I'm not as familiar with that area, but I do know where the, where the four-way stop would be. Um, what I would like to prefer to do is to have the city come in with their traffic control mechanism and do a complete study of that before we make a decision. And let me give you an example of that. On Webster Street, we had about 30 constituents we met with um, about a month ago. They had a problem with speeding on Webster. People were cutting off of Highbury and, and using Webster as a shortcut to save maybe 20 seconds. And I was able to contact City Hall. They were able to provide us with a form, which I provided to the citizens. And they were able to contact the city, uh, get 10, 10 signatures, contact the city, and be provided with a, um, a mechanism that will uh, determine traffic control and speed and safety measures and so on. So I think with respect to VESTA, the same thing should be done there. We need to look at it. We need to have uh, a specialist come out and take a look at traffic safety and controls. But yes, I, I definitely think that we need to look at improving uh, the traffic measures there. Thank you. Thank you. And who would like to provide a rebuttal? Uh, Prob and then Bob. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm very much familiar with the uh, with the issue there. Uh, when canvassing, I hear this a lot. Whether you put a stop sign or not, uh, people who are going to violate the law, they'll still do it. And the response I get, why is the stop sign there anyway? So we need to put calming measures, such as uh, you know soft softeners, uh, speed bumps. Uh, measuring uh, uh, sp speed devices, and we definitely need uh, a little more pr police patrolling because not only the the, the traffic is an issue, the, the issues are also you know uh, breaking enter people. You know, uh, apparently I heard that, that there's a there's a so-called uh, pickup truck gang going on and picking up people's bicycle. That's one of the issues we're happen happening there. So definitely the, the stop sign should be addressed 100%. A uh, prime example is that uh, what Mr. Curry is referring to uh, on West End Fuller, uh, that's uh, near Hillcrest Public School. That area is literally uh, a high school, uh, high school uh, student area, and that needs to be addressed even further about the uh, traffic issue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bob? I think Peter set out more or less what the process needs to be. It is not our job as councillors to promise you that we're going to get a four-way stop here or a stop like there. There are procedures for how to go about doing that. And the first step 
in the Vesta Road area, and I think I talked to the woman who probably asked that question, is to speak to the other main neighbors and to get a consensus, is that in fact what the neighborhood wants? Do they want a four-way stop at Vesta? That's the first step. The second step is then to do some of the traffic measures that Peter's talking about to say, okay, will the city actually do that? Um, I've talked to people this week who are really happy about the new speed bumps on Fuller and people who are very unhappy about the old ones on Hillcrest. Um, there, there needs to be some consultation with the neighbors about what it is they actually want before I promise you to do whatever it is I'm gonna do. And I will help people with that bureaucracy. I'll help you with the petition or whatever. Sorry. Thank you. Time again. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so the next question is for Ainsley. What will you do to integrate the relationship between Fanshawe College and Ward 3? The population is increasing while the relationship between the school and the community seems to be seems to have decreased. That's a really good question. Um, I think it would be very important to have festivals or events that invite the people that live in the neighborhood to meet the students that are moving into the area. Um, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to pass. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. No problem. Anybody else would like to respond? Okay, so we'll go Peter, Prob, and then Bob, did you raise your hand yes. or no? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Fanshawe College is critical to Ward 3. Not only is it our largest stakeholder, but it is an incredible resource for us. We have to develop closer relationships with the management and with the administration at Fanshawe College and for too long, they haven't, we ha they haven't felt to be a part of our ward. So we need to develop that. I developed a relationship with Fanshawe many years ago. My son went to Fanshawe and studied electrical training, but I put money into Fanshawe uh, recently through a, um, a, a donation uh, for my wife's, uh, in memory of my wife. And it's been a great relationship that I developed with him. And we need to continue to develop that relationship and that partnership with, with Fanshawe. We focus too much time on Western when we need the skill sets and the training and the tradespeople that Fanshawe develops for us. And those are the people, the trades and the skills that we can retain into the city and, and build on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prob, please. If you don't mind repeating the question, I think that has to do with the, uh, the absentee landlords as well. So if you can, yeah. Sure, it's not stated that way, but I'll read the question again. What will you do to integrate the relationship between Fanshawe and Ward 3? The population is increasing while the relationship between the school and the community seems to have decreased. Well, it's a, uh, Fanshawe is, a, is an essential uh, resource of Ward 3 because, first of all, not only it's close by the ward, it's the heart of the ward. That's what the, the heart of education is. You know, colleges are seem to be more hands-on training rather than theory. And I, I truly believe that, you know, we need, as Ainsley said, we need to bring neighborhoods to the uh, workshops and, and promote a, a real college culture. That's we're really missing on that real college culture because what it used to be, if you want to get a job, say, you know, skill trade, you would go to college rather than university. I'm not saying university have great programs. Also, just because uh, Fanshawe uh, increase of uh, population of students, I truly believe that, and I've, I've heard this from constituents saying that, you know, there are a larger amount of uh, tenants coming from the community as well. And the, the, the problem is that, you know, there are too many absentee landlords, uh, you know, uh, which is, which, which, which happened to cause a problem. You're over uh, your time, yeah. Prop. Sorry, Sorry about that. Thank, thank you. you. Bob? I couldn't empathize with Ainsley more about how difficult a question this is to address. It's a hard one to even know where to start. Mm -hmm. I agree with Peter. Fanshawe is an economic engine of the London community and Ward 3. It's vital to our economic future. At the same time, the state of some of those neighborhoods, and I grew up in the neighborhood adjacent to Fanshawe, is appalling. Like, I have been shocked 
canvassing in some of those neighborhoods at the state of the neighborhood, which is largely a result of what Prob was mentioning, absentee landlords. And I, 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 I'm, be very honest, I'm not absolutely sure where to start, but that is a question we really need to take by the horns and deal with before we end up with literal ghettos. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two more um, questions from advanced registration. Um, so we'll start with Bob again, and then once you're done those two, um, get ready with your own questions. So we will turn it to the audience at large. So the question for you, Bob, is how will you foster community and connection within Ward 3? Oh, I think we've got some of the basics there. We've got at least two pretty lively community associations on Facebook. Uh, Huron Heights just did a really nice movie night where they're involved with the community. I must admit the one thing that really distressed me was the woman who ran that indicated on the night that she wasn't getting a lot of support from other people in the community and that if she didn't get that, she would quit. And I went, you know, hey, give it a chance because COVID's kind of put a damper on things for the last couple of years. So uh, supporting and becoming part of those associations, certainly as a councillor, I'd like to be an active part of all of them. Uh, there are at least three that I'm aware of, Kaleli, Huron Heights, and there's actually an Argyle group as well that immediately deals with the area around Fanshawe. Uh, I think, you know, the councillor needs to be, you know, on the phone to those people all the time. What can I do to help? What kind of city resources can we uh, foster for you to get the community more involved? The other thing is the neighborhood decision-making program. When I got into this campaign, my first thing was to drop pamphlets around the Franklin Roosevelt area to support their neighborhood decision-making project very happy to say it ended up coming third in the entire city. I think it's the most votes a project in Ward 3 has ever got. My biggest regret is that I didn't put a similar amount of effort into the second project that fell short by 23 votes. So mm -hmm. it would, was quite possible that Ward 3 would have got all $50,000 of the National neighborhood decision-making program if I just hadn't have done the politically correct thing and said vote for two out of three if I had to just said vote for two of these. So I'm still learning. I will continue to learn and I hope to learn on your behalf. Thank you. Anyone else would like to respond? Saifula, Peter, and then Prab. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of things and a lot of uh, way we can bring the ward number three closer to each other. A few weeks before there was a movie night and city arranged that movie night and there are a lot of kids, a lot of families, they get together and they enjoyed the movie. It is one of the way. And then the other way we can have time to time get together parties of the local community of different areas in ward number three and that way we can bring closer to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Uh, do you mind repeating the question again? No problem. How will you foster community and connection within Ward 3? Thank you. You know, Bob referenced Jacqueline Fraser. I suspect that was Jacqueline you were talking about, Bob, who said she was going to quit if she didn't get more support. And it's not the support coming from inside the community. It's coming from outside the community as she's trying to bond all of Ward 3 together. And that's the struggle because we have not bonded as a community you take a look at some of the other wards and they actually do bond well and they're all working together but that cooperation isn't here and bob referenced that he said that you've got uh, areas like kaleli and other areas of like argyle that that could be part of one and they're not and that's what we need to do and a good counselor will do that he'll bring all the he or she will bring all of the communities together and make them, and not make them, but, but get them to cooperate and work together. And we need more community events, just like Bob referenced. We hit the one at Huron Heights the other night, the movie night, it was fantastic. We need more of that, and the kids had a great time. But again, we need more investment. We need, we need more investment in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Lastly, Prop. Yep, well, Bob said it all, and uh, so was Mr. Cuddy. I just want to add uh, uh, some things to it. Uh, Ward 3 is, is highly multicultural. And as being uh, ethnic myself uh, from a diverse background, I speak four 
uh, you know, different languages, I understand the culture and uh, the, uh, the practices. We need to bring um, festivities among neighborhoods. Who doesn't like food? Everybody, everybody <laughs> loves food, right? Who doesn't like music? And that's what we need, a prosperity, connection. You know what? That's, that's one of the easiest things uh, you know, we can do, not only as a counselor, as a neighbor. So I will work extra mile to bring prosperity to a neighborhood. I'll be a bridge to fill the gap what we're having, and during the pandemic, that was a disaster, and I'm, I promise you that, that that we can do, Bob, right? We, we can promise that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and yes, we will do it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Saifula, and this is the last one from uh, the registrations. Municipal politicians claim they, uh, um, that they are no, not partisan but we are all aware that they vote provincially and federally. This means they are associated with a political platform. Do you think people align with a political platform because of personal values? Please repeat the question. Sure. Municipal politicians claim they are not partisan, but we are all, we are all aware that they vote provincially and federally. This means they are associated with a political platform. Do you think people align with a political platform because of personal values? I think I will pass this question. Sure, I'm not, is the person here? Because I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm reading it properly. The personal values, I just don't. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was, I was wondering because I felt like people align with political platforms because of personal values and what they see their community or society to be. So uh, it was a roundabout way of saying, are you taking your political platform with you into the municipality to make changes or not? Okay, so Fula, do you feel like that, that, that gives you a bit more context to answer? So actually, I'm not feeling comfortable with that question. Okay, no problem. So no problem, Saifula. So let's go Ainsley, Bob, and then Prab. So I definitely feel that people bring um, or go to certain political parties because of their values. Um, but I also believe that as a counselor, you need to be able to be unbiased in your decision making. You can't bring the political party into your job, and I think it needs to stay separate. Okay, and Prob? So I, I agree with uh, Ansley. See, my campaign is more of an educational campaign. When I'm asked this question at the door, what party you align with? And I, my answer is that you're my party. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah. And that is the, the, the precise <laughs> yeah. I am the party. So we, we have to be there for the, uh, for the people of Ward 3. It's what they feel. If we start to drift away from the question, we leave them more confusing. We cannot do that. We have to let them know. Every party, they have their own policies. But as a municipal candidate, I, I believe in you. I believe that I'm here to listen, and I will, I will bring the best. And that's all you can do, I believe. And I, I will continue to do that because I believe in human values, and, and that's why I'm a strong advocate on that, and I'll keep on bringing uh, this over and over. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. I imagine most of us at this table have a political affiliation. I think it's important, in, in so far as possible, for municipal councillors to remain apolitical not associated with the party. And that's somewhat difficult for some of us because we're more closely aligned uh, than others. But it's important, I think, in dealing with the other levels of government not to represent a partisan approach to the issue. I don't want to be going to Queen's Park and being told, well, you know, you're just saying that because you're a liberal or an NDP and we're conservative. It's really important then London can come with one voice to Queen's Park and say, this is what London needs. This is what Ward 3 needs. Not, this is what the Liberals want, or this is what the NDP want, or this is what the Conservatives want. I think it's very important to remain as apolitical as, not apolitical, apartisan as possible at City Hall. Thank you, Peter. The other night I went to a, to a door and um, uh, the woman answered the door and uh, she said, you're wearing blue. Does that mean anything? And I said, 
yeah, it matches my eyes. And she said, you're right, it does. You know, I, I, well, I, we laugh at this, but truthfully, we do need to be apolitical, as Bob suggested. One of the things that I've enjoyed about municipal politics, being a, a school board trustee or now running as a, a councillor for Ward 3, is the people you meet and that you work with. One of the guys that I've met has been Sean Lewis from Ward 2. He, Sean and I couldn't be further apart in some of our political views, but I know we could work together on council. And I'm looking forward to that opportunity, to working with people where we may not share the same views, but we can work together for the benefit of Ward 3. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So that's the end of uh, the registered questions. I'm going to explain the rules for the questions for audience at large. I will ask you to hold up your hand when you have a question. Once I acknowledge you, would you identify yourself and the candidate or candidates you want to answer your question? Please speak loudly so that everyone can understand your question. And now this is the important part. We're giving you 30 seconds to answer, to ask your question. So please be as concise as possible and when possible, start with your question. Thank you very much. Now who would like to start? Okay, so we have about 20 minutes, so I think I'm going to start with three questions. Uh, the lady who's holding her hand up highest, <laughs> for, we'll go first, and then, sorry, and then, the, no, so the person in the back here, then the person in the fourth row, and then, yes, you, there you go, thank you. <laughs> and then we'll go from there and we'll see how much time we have. So please go ahead, as I mentioned before, identify yourself, the candidate you would like the, uh, to answer your question. It could be more than one candidate. And please uh, be as concise as possible. You have 30 seconds. Thank you. I'm Pauline House, and I had created the Neighborhood um, Association for Huron Heights Phase 1. What I'm asking is, I know these two live in Huron, or live in Ward 3. I'm wondering if the last three um, candidates live now in Ward 3, not grew up in it, but live now in Ward 3, for the last three. Sure, go ahead, Saifullah, you can start and then yeah. we'll go in order. I am living in Ward number 3 from the last three years. My home address is 1966 Cedar Park Drive, London, Ontario, N5X0J1. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so make sure if you are in the ward, so you are most welcome to my house, 1966 Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Ainsley and then Peter. So to answer your question, um, I did live here for 21 years. Um, I do currently live in another part of the city. It was an affordability issue. My husband and I found a house that we could afford uh, before everything <laughs> blew up. Um, but my parents still live in the ward. I am back, well, before campaigning, I am back at least minimum two times a week. Um, so I know this ward really, really well. During campaign, I'm here every day. So, yeah. Peter? Uh, I've made no secret to the fact that I don't live in the ward. I live in Ward 13. My late wife and I bought a property 39 years ago. Uh, and uh, my, my old neighbors are in the back there, by the way. Uh, the Parades, and we bought a property 39 years ago and we fixed it up and when she died in 2015 uh, I could not leave. Um, not to say I would have moved to Ward 3 but I just couldn't leave. But the important part is I own property in Ward 3 so I, own, I pay property taxes and I also worked in Ward 3 for 25 years out at the Cuddy plant. I was a plant supervisor. So if you want to talk about somebody who's invested in this community it's, it's me, because I know it well, and I have been here as an investor, and I've been here um, as an, sorry, I've been here as a worker as an, and as an investor. Thank you. Thank you. Now there is a woman in the fourth row, I believe, third row. Yep, that's you. Thank you. 30 seconds. I'm Joanne DeWild, Apache, in Chippewa. It is a hornet's nest. I don't, I'm going to ask these two gentlemen because they live in the same area that I guess I live. And I asked this gentleman, uh, we moved in there in 93, and the guy said to me, the reason everybody's taking their kids to school by automobile is because there's a pervert 
a, a man that attacks children in the area, and so the parents were advised to take their children. What's with. your question, ma'am? Sorry. What can you do about that? Thank it's you. a hornet's nest at Apache in Chippewa. Drive through there when the school is going in or out. I think what you're describing is actually not an uncommon occurrence at almost all the schools. I mean, they're all over the place? Yeah. Um, I got the same complaint when I was visiting uh, near Hillcrest School. That, that the, they blocked my driveway. I, I have heard that complaint in other areas of the ward. It's an issue that I think we need to refer to traffic enforcement. I think traffic enforcement is incredibly underserved in the war like when I you know prob mentioned that it just because you put up a stop sign it's not going to prevent somebody from running through it um, you know we do need some enforcement around just some of the traffic provisions that exist currently I am terrified okay. two children in my family have been run over right. I am terrified I'm going to get up one morning and there's going to be a dead child out in front of my house. And I know you're saying, send it to the traffic. But can you do anything about it? Personally, no. And I've forgotten your name, but well, I know you know who I am. Well. Thank you for your question. And you know what? My heart goes out to the, uh, to the neighbors who have to deal with this kind of uh, uh, stuff yeah. because... It is fear, very much fear. What we can do uh, personally, as I said, there's, we cannot make promises till we get elected. That's, that's the thing we have to understand. Even when we get elected, we are one vote. And that's another problem. Why can we, why can the neighbors, like our community within the neighborhood get together and watch out for each other? That's on. So, sorry, ma'am. Please let him answer the question, just so. Yeah. We can. So, so let me let me. Uh, so in, in uh, there was a in a Kipps Lane area. I was the, there the other night, and then I literally saw with my own eyes. Uh, there was a bend, a sports car speeding by, and I was personally going to get killed. I had my uh, volunteers with me. We made, a, we made a call to the police, and guess what? They, they, they told me, is anyone hurt? This is it. If we need to address this issue to the police. We need to get the community Thank involved, you. and we have to continue. So Your time is up, Rob. Sorry. Thank you. And we have, for now, one more question. Yep, that's you. Thank you. Get up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I drive for paratransit, and I'm not going to say much about my experience. I also drive for Uber. Um, I guess I heard about buses a little bit, active transportation, bike lanes, traffic safety, you know, speed bumps, stop signs, just about everything but paratransit. And I'm just uh, I'm asking anybody um, up here. Uh, the five of you, when you've been canvassing and going door to door, have you heard from any of my customers or people who work for Paratransit about the issues that they are facing with the service? Because the service is funded by through LTC uh, money, so it's municipal dollars, plus I guess other sources of funding. But uh, do you have any idea of the issues facing the service and any ideas of how to fix some of the issues? So who would like to answer that question first? Uh, Bob, and then who else? I'll, I'll frankly give you a non-answer. I'm not aware of the issues, and I'd like to hear more about them when you got some time. I, I, I have not heard anything at the doors in terms of complaints and or praise about paratransit. Uh, okay, Prob? Well, I was, I was echoing with Bob. And that, that's a thing we, we need to be present and listen to the issues. That's what we're running, actually. That's what I'm running. And this issue can be brought to attention, and we will definitely will work uh, towards it to resolve it. Thank you. Thank you. So now I think we have time for two more questions, going to focus on this side of the room. Um, 
one, the woman in the green sweater and the uh, gentleman in the beige button down. We'll start with that and then after that, um, please don't forget between 8.30 and 9, it's an informal time to be asking questions to the candidates. So even though it's not formal this way, you still have the opportunity to speak to your candidates. So uh, the woman in the green cardigan, please. Hi, um, my, name is, um, my name is Teresa and um, thank you all for taking the time tonight to um, give us your views on various issues. Um, I'm mainly interested in Bob's um, answer to this question. I'm just wondering what your position is on um, balancing the need to preserve our diminishing green spaces um, in the face of uh, increasing interest um, on the part of the city to expand development. Um, I would especially draw your attention to the proposed um, high rises for that are scheduled to be built or I guess proposed to be built on Highbury um, close to Kaleli. Thank you. Okay. I think it's very important that we set aside and preserve green spaces. Some of that's been done in the planning proposals for Ward 3. A lot more could be done because there's a lot of land that's potentially developable that does not yet, is not yet subject to a planning application. Uh, specifically, the one thing that's been brought to my attention during the campaign, which I had absolutely no knowledge of, is the city has started to consider whether or not they're going to sell the River Road Golf Course. And I've actually committed to a group of people that I do not favor the sale of that land, that I want it preserved as green space. And perhaps even I'm open to reopening it as a golf course if the business case can be made. But in any case, I'd like it preserved as public parkland. Specifically with regards to the apartment buildings, apartments are an essential part of dealing with intensification in the city and dealing with the challenge. Now, that particular planning proposal, I think, is way too high, has all kinds of other issues, but it does set aside a good deal of the green space. Thank you. Um, so Peter would like to respond. Is there anyone else who would like to respond to this question? Okay, Peter and Prob. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, with reference to the development on Highbury, backing on to Webster Street, uh, I met with, uh, with Sean Lewis and I met with about 30 residents on Webster about two months ago because of their concerns for that development. That development is to be built on wetland. They have to drain 450,000 liters of water a day, a day, until they drain it. I talk, spoke to the folks that were sitting there. I said, how many of you folks are in a well? Half the well water, half their hands went up. Well, I said, they're gonna drain your wells. I said, no, they're not. I said, I'm from Strathroy. I, I grew up in Strathroy. I know how deep wells are and how can they can be drained. The point I'm trying to make is that they can't build a development that dense, uh, that densely populated on that site. They haven't even done a traffic study on there. So Sean Lewis was going to look into it and he was going to report to the Upper Thames Conservation Authority to see if they could do something about reducing the density of that development because you cannot build like that on, on wetland like, like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now Prob? Well, Mr. Wright has answered the first part of that question and thank you for the question, ma'am. I will definitely advocate on, on the, uh, the green spaces. Uh, it's essential that we maintain balance. Uh, we cannot have too much commercialization going on and then forgetting the sense of community. We need to maintain a balance because when we go out to walk, we need to have a peace. If we miss the fact that we're missing on canopies and, and uh, green spaces, which are, which, are, which are essential for oxygen, as we all know, uh, we need to uh, you know, uh, raise a voice for that, and which I will uh, do passionately. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have one last question, and after that it will be the informal portion. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. In 30 seconds, uh, please. I'm Bill Brock. I live in War Two, and I'm, I'm here because I need you. <laughs> um, my question to you is simply this. Do you have the capability to convince seven other councillors to vote with you on what's needed versus what's nice? If you don't have that ability, and if you watch the way they've operated, you'd see what I'm talking about. If you don't have that ability, then why vote for a change rather than just because the one that was here has gone? So what's, how do you see that in your role? Thank you. Now, just to clarify, this is for all candidates? This is for all candidates. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's start with Ainsley, because we haven't heard from you in a while. Saifula, 
Peter, Prob, and then Bob. So obviously being on council, you're working as a team and you are working with other council members as well. And we all will have different uh, needs that we are trying to get done. For me, essentially, it is really important to keep in mind that everything that I do is for the people living in my ward. I have the city as a greater whole, and I do, um, I do know that. But at the same time, you were the ones that elected me, and that is what I owe you, and I owe it to you to hear you and to represent, or to represent you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Saifula. Thank you very much. So it is a very, very important question for me because there are two things. So on one side is my ward people and the other side is the city as a whole. So definitely when we are working together, we have to set our goal being a counselor in the city. So what is the best interest of the city as a whole? And then the ward people comes at the next priority. Even I am elected from my ward people, so I have the sympathy for the people living in my ward. But first of all, I have to go through the city as a whole for the interest of the whole Londoners. And then I will come to my ward people. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I was elected uh, vice chair of the Thames Valley School Board this year precisely because I can get along with people. I, I grew up in the country. And when you, when, when you grow up in the country, you tend to be able to get together with urban people fairly well. And because the Thames Valley District School Board has an urban split of, of six and six on the rural side, not easy to get along with. But everyone, uh, every of my, one of my colleagues identified the fact that I can get along with people, not because I'm more persuasive, but because I'm reasonable and we can come to reasonable solutions. And to answer your question, I think I can bring that to council. I think I can convince those people, those other councillors, th to see either see my way or that we can find a, a, a similar solution that works for the city and works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Prop? Well, thank you, sir, for asking this question. Um, the answer to this question is shared leadership. Not only are you selecting, uh, electing uh, a councillor, you're electing a leader of your ward. A leader who believes in shared leadership, meaning that a leader will em also empower others to become leaders. Before seek assistance from other counselor, you have to show initiative that you be there for them. That's the kind of dealing we need to do. We need to step up and need to focus on the Ward 3 and its constituents, which matter the most to me, and then work as a, uh, work as a, as a leader uh, towards learners as a whole. And as I said before, uh, a counselor is a one vote, but not to forget, advocating on the behalf of the people of Ward 3 and constituents, you have to repeat it. You have to fight it and just keep walking just like, a, just like soldiers do. You got to keep marching, not to give up. And that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Bob. I had this conversation with a fellow at the door yesterday who compared counsel to herding cats. And he asked if I was a cat or the herder. And I said, I hoped I was the herder. I have a master's in law in alternative dispute resolution. I have 22 years working experience as a senior mediator for the Ontario government. If I can't get people together, I'm not sure anyone can. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so this ends the formal portion of the evening. I would like to thank each of the candidates running for office. Thank you for participating today and for taking the first step in serving your community. I would also like to thank each of you in the audience for coming out today and informing yourself about local candidates. Finally, don't forget to vote. The election day is Monday, October 24th, 2022. Um, as I had mentioned before, feel free to stay and talk with the candidates as our volunteers clean up behind you. Uh, we will ask that everyone leaves the building right on time, which is 9 p.m. sharp. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night and stay safe. Are we not in the